This is Scott from California. When I'm not hiking at national parks, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today I'm celebrating Earth Day by cleaning up. Because, after all, Earth ain't Uranus. While I'm using a rake, you can celebrate with your headphones because we're welcoming special guest, the man who went from monk to money manager, Doug Lynham. And a new study shows the relationship between education and financial wellness. Here with the results of the 2019 Personal Finance Index, say hello to TIAA Institute senior economist Paul Yakubowski. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky caller, answer a letter from the mailbag, and still leave time for, yep, you guessed it, my incredible trivia. And now, two guys who we've planted in front of a microphone. I still got it. It's Joe and oh, j j j j j Oh, nothing better than Earth Day humor for the win. Doug is sure shoveling it <laughs> today. He's raking in the laughs. Knee deep in manure. Happy Earth Day, know. OG. Happy Earth Day. Is that a, that's a holiday? I saw some... Uh, is, is that a holiday? Is that a thing? You know, Earth Day gets it's once... an everyday a, Earth Day? Earth Day gets... It should be every day. But sadly, it's once a year. While s- the sun gets a day every week, as does the moon. Huh. Think about the injustice there. So do tacos. So. It, 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 good point. Good point. You know who else should get their own day of the week? MetPro. Although you should be doing MetPro every day of the week. Good point. Or does your coach uh, remind you of that, that you yes. should be doing MetPro every day of the week? Where is there that? are no off days. Thanks to MetPro for supporting Stacky Benjamins for a complimentary metabolic profiling assessment. We'll talk to OG a little bit later about how that works. And a 30-minute consultation with a MetPro expert like OG has telling him that every day is MetPro Day. Head to metpro.co slash SB. It's metpro.co, not .com. Thanks also to LinkedIn for supporting Stacky Benjamins. LinkedIn Jobs makes it easy to get matched with quality candidates who make the most sense for your role. Post a job today at linkedin.com slash SB and get $50 off your first job post. It's linkedin.com slash SB. Terms and conditions apply. We got a great show today. It's Earth Day. We got the monk who became a money manager hanging out with us, Paul Yakubowski on my dad's shortwave, uh, talking about financial literacy. We're going to get something done today. It must be Earth Day, OG. It's got to be. Today's the day. It is the day. So let's get it started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline is a headline that you will only find if you had this email sent to you. This was sent to us by listener Colin. This is about the Fundrise IPO. Oh, wow. They're IPO already? Have you been reading about this? Well, you hear about an IPO. You know what that means. That means, means <laughs> someday in the future, they might be profitable. That means an initial public offering. Listen to this. Uh, the letter, which has a little personalization feature at the front end, says, Colin... Last week, we introduced you to the Fundrise IPO, the first of its kind internet public offering, not initial public offering. You hear IPO, you might think initial public offering, you know, because every single that's what it means. Every single other one does that, but not Fundrise, who has historically done things differently, like in the past, have marketing messages on their front page that say things like, engineered for superior results fake news just a little little deceptive back there fundrise but uh and luckily that's all gone by the way just in fairness mm-hmm. to fundrise yes they did it and yes they took it down however we now have the internet public offering which gives you og you well not you colin who sent us this note the opportunity to buy an ownership stake in fundrise the company itself Because this type of early stage investing, I'm reading from the letter, 
Because this type of early stage investing is not typically available to most investors, it's common to have some questions. <laughs> yeah. Like, is this a good idea? Below our like, a- how do how, how do I delete my email from your records? <laughs> Below our answers to some of the most frequently asked questions we receive about the fundrise, I, little I, so cute, PO. What exactly T-O. am I T trademark? <laughs> What exactly am I investing in? It's so funny. While Zoom and Pinterest are having real IPOs, we've got we've got this. And, and you My thought, favorite one was the Uber one. When in their guidance, you know, they're like, "We're not sure if we're ever going to be profitable." We like never. they specifically said that. People are like, "Cool, so can I can buy into that, right?" <laughs> Stop. So you're saying the math might never work. How do I get it? How do I get in? Like yes. I'm in. Question number one, what exactly am I investing in? When you invest in the fun rise. You'd like to know. Next question. <laughs> Little I, P.O., you are purchasing shares of Rise Companies Corporation, the parent company and owner of Fundrise. How do I make money? Your returns will be based on the change in the value of the company over time. We believe the long-term potential for Fundrise is substantial. You know why they why do we're giving it away right now at the low, low price of X dollars per share. That's why we're not going to angel investors that have deep pockets. That's why we're coming to you, Colin. And I'm not saying that Colin doesn't have deep pockets, but that's why we do this mass mailing <laughs> because, because, uh, this is, this is a hot commodity. You know why we're trying to bring this great idea to the everyman. It's because all Soft those bank was full up and their subscriptions, they, they couldn't balance out their Ten billion dollar investment in WeWork and other places to throw a few hundred million this way, so they oversubscribed. <laughs> SoftBank was way too excited, so we said, "You know what? We're yeah. not going to let guys, that." You guys, you guys are too over the moon. Yes. Whoa, whoa, Dial whoa! Back. back away, big money. This is for the common man. Yep. Uh, how we believe the long term market potential for Fundrise is substantial, and our traction to date demonstrates our performance trajectory. However. The, you know why? That's because they're engineered for superior results. Engineered. It's, 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 said it, it's said it on the front page of Fundrise that they were engineered for. I mean, it's real estate. Nobody else has known about real estate ever. Fundrise figured it out. Stop arguing with science. Yes. How long should I expect to hold this investment? The Fundrise, this is where your stomach goes down. Remember how we said last week we were talking about things like Acre Trader and Masterworks? They tell you exactly this is our plan for how you sell this property. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a liquid. Here's, here's the plan. Fundrise IPO, little I. Meant to be a long-term illiquid investment. Our goal is to provide liquidity in the future through a potential traditional IPO on a stock exchange or a sale of the company. However, unlike our real estate offerings, the Fundrise IPO does not expect to pay a dividend during the term of the investment, and there may be limited or no possibility for redemption. Accordingly, investors of the Fundrise IPO should be prepared to hold the investment indefinitely until such time as the company experiences a liquidation event, if any. How's the Fundrise IPO different than a traditional big eye PO? The Fundrise IPO is an internet public offering where we're selling shares in the parent company as part of an early stage investment in our growth. Unlike a traditional IPO initial public offering, the Fundrise Little IPO is what's called a primary offering and shares are not being listed on an exchange, nor will they be publicly traded. When and how can I invest? Over the coming weeks, we'll provide you all the information we need to invest. You'll need to invest. We expect to make the IPO available to you to invest in mid-May. Here's the funny thing. Hard pass. Thanks. In this letter, and by the way, I also say hard pass And not that I know anything about how Fundrise works on the inside. I know absolutely zero about how it works. But companies don't come to, I hate to say this, Colin, companies don't come to Colin Mm -hmm. when they could get the big money. They don't. And Yeah. Jamie Dimon's not calling you for... And maybe this is the first one. Maybe it is. Maybe. Maybe maybe they're... I mean, because it's Earth Day, maybe these people are people who sit... And hold hands. And well, see. maybe when Colin gets the next level of stuff, he can send that also. And we can talk about the financials because I'm assuming they're going to send financial data too. <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe it's just like, so you in? I mean, this is awesome, right? Yeah. So we'll take 
Wouldn't singles, that be great? dives, whatever, whatever you want to send, put it in an envelope. <laughs> we take checks payable to our good friend, our charitable annuity strategy holding company, or we like to call it cash. Let's put, <laughs> I see what you did there. Uh, let's put a final stake in this one. OG. If I put here Fundrise IPO in my Bing search, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, and I hit news, this is dated February 8th, 2017. Fundrise members invest $14.6 million in company as part of, quote, internet public offering. Fundrise, a platform that allows online investors to put money into its real estate funds, has now allowed its members to own shares of the company itself. The company raised $14.6 million in what it called an internet public offering, outpacing its $10 million goal for the 24-hour period. More than 2,300 members participated in the Little I PO. This move, which will not put Fundrise on a public stock exchange, allows its members to invest at an early stage in the company's growth than when typical IPOs take place. The method of selling its shares directly to its members rather than going through an investment bank was made legal by the 2012 Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act. We've made our users partners in our future, and we look forward to sharing in our success together. Fundrise CEO Ben Miller said in a release, just like Vanguard, we believe the fund just, just like Vanguard. <laughs> Swing and a miss. We believe the Fundrise IPO aligns our interests with our users, which means we won't have to weigh what's best for our owners versus our customers because they're now one in the same. Here's the thing, guys. In Colin's letter, guess what it says? Same thing? No. It uses the words first of its kind. Oh, it turns out, kids, it's not the first of its kind because Fundrise did the same thing two years ago. It's the second of its kind, Fundrise. I think they've done it a couple of times, but yeah. Your internet public offerings are engineered for success. They are engineered. And in our second headline, TIA Institute and GFLEC are out with the 2019 Personal Finance Index, and that measures financial literacy in the United States and its link to financial wellness. And here, helping us sort through it and find out all the good stuff that's in the index this year, from TIA Institute, it's our new friend, Paul Yakabowski on My Dad Shortwave. How are you, man? I'm doing excellent, Joe. Great to join you. Well, I'm glad you could be here. How does this index work? You guys refer to it as the PFIN index? Right. That's shorthand for personal finance index. Our objective with it is to measure knowledge and understanding that enable sound financial decision making. How does it work? We field a survey that consists of 28 questions with a sample of the U.S. adult population. And what makes this one unique is that it covers eight functional areas, eight areas where individuals routinely have to make financial decisions. So things like saving, consuming, investing, but also borrowing, insuring, um, comprehending risk is another area. I saw that a lot of people didn't get uh, many questions right, Paul. (laughs) Well, yep, that's the case. If we look at the aggregate, on average, U.S. adults answered only 51% of the questions correctly. So, you know, boil it down, uh, Americans just, in many cases, lack the the personal financial knowledge that enables sound financial decision-making. Well, you've got our whole audience now leaning into their listening device, wondering what, what a lot of these questions are. Can you tell us what a few of the questions are that might have stumped a lot of people? Well, the area where knowledge was lowest was actually comprehending risk. That's problematic when you step back and think about it because personal finances inherently involve risk. And I'm not really even just talking about investment risk, but just, you know, risk from day to day, year to year, how things are going to change and evolve, what may happen. So, for example, we have a question that presents two scenarios, one with a car needing repair, another one with an air conditioning unit needing repair. And there's a different chance of each happening and a different price tag on each. And it really gets at the idea of which one of these scenarios is the bigger risk. And to understand that they they have to trade off, not only look at the price tag attached to each, but the likelihood of it happening, because that's the basic fundamental there. Likelihood of things happening along with 
well, what's it going to cost if it happens? Or the flip side, what's the benefit going to be if it happens? So that's an example from the area where financial literacy is lowest. Gotcha. I mean, that's kind of a big question that people have had before is, you know, my car's worth a lot less than my house in most, in most cases, but my car insurance costs more. That's the kind of thing you're talking about. Um, that's part of it. Um, you know, we did have some questions specific to insurance itself. I think individuals have to make a lot of insurance choices. Think about health insurance choices nowadays. And do they understand the trade-off between deductibles and premiums? Do they understand in other scenarios what a copay is, for example? And when we delved into that, again, knowledge in that area was relatively low as well. I want to dive into a few of the key insights here. One is, it looks like you found financial literacy increased with education. Do you think that's mostly surround sound? People in higher education are more around people who historically have been good with money, or do you think it's they're being taught more in colleges than they are in high school? Well, we looked at education from two perspectives. Formal education, So, you know, how far did you progress, high school, some college, college degree, and you see a a consistent rise in financial literacy across those dimensions. And we also look specifically at, well, have you ever received uh, financial education in some type of course? And it was higher if you had than if you hadn't. That's not a surprise. I think as far as the general education goes, we know that it's financial education. Uh, literacy isn't covered a lot or typically. So I think that's more the case of just a higher education level yeah. um, along the way, you know, more math and things like that. Individuals are just able to pick up some things uh, better along the way. It's not that if you look at those with a college degree, for example, that, well, hey, their financial literacy is really high. Um, yeah. They're good. Yeah, you know, it's not. <laughs> it's just that it's not as low right. as uh, someone who uh, hasn't completed high school even. That's bad, Paul, when we're talking about degrees of lowness. Um, well, you know, sometimes that's the appropriate framing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you also noted here and, and saw that people with greater literacy actually seek advice from, I guess, not just from professionals, but from just people around them. Well, we did look to link financial literacy with financial well-being. And we did that by looking at some behaviors that you would think would lead to better financial outcomes as well as some objective indicators. And one thing we did ask was whether individuals had received advice from a financial advisor. Uh And individuals with greater financial literacy levels were more likely to have done so. And that's perfect. They should be complimentary. Uh, you want to go into that type of discussion with, with a base level of financial understanding so you can be an active participant in it. Uh, we shouldn't really view financial advice as a substitute, if you will, for financial literacy. Are, are you seeing year-over-year financial literacies improving or not? Well, and this is the third wave of the survey, so that really amounts to two years going by. And if we look at the fraction of questions answered correctly, it's gone from 49% to 50% to 51%. And that blip up and then blip up again. It's interesting, you know, statistically, those differences are not significant. We did see those small types of blips in six of the eight functional areas as well. So I cast it more in terms of Oh, we may, may be, you know, at the beginning of seeing financial literacy levels beginning to creep up, but it's really too soon to tell. I mean, just you put confidence in intervals around those numbers and they're still essentially the same. Yeah. What would you say would be for you this year, Paul, the biggest takeaway from the index? I think big takeaway this year is focusing on that link to financial well-being because, you know, individuals don't really and shouldn't really care about financial literacy, you know, for the sake of financial literacy itself. It's not the end, but it's it's something you need along the way to achieve financial wellness, to achieve financial well being. And we saw that definitively uh, when we looked at our eight indicators of financial wellness. So I think that just 
really emphasizes how important it is for individuals to, you know, take it upon themselves, really, and avail themselves to resources to increase their financial literacy because of the payoff it has for them. Yeah, I love that takeaway. By the way, if you're on your commute or you're walking the dog or on your morning run, whatever it might be, we've got you covered. We'll have a link to the TIA Institute page that has all the details on the, on the index on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Paul Yakubowski, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes and walking us through the index. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Big thanks to Paul Yakubowski for chatting with us. You know, OG, when we talk about education, we talk about putting your best foot forward when it comes to your financial situation. We could talk about the same with your business. The best way to put your best foot forward is to find quality candidates for your business. And LinkedIn Jobs makes it easy to get matched with quality candidates who make the most sense for your role. Odds are person you're looking for is on LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs uses knowledge of both hard skills and soft skills to match you with the people who fit your role the best. Of course, people come to LinkedIn every day to learn and advance their careers. So LinkedIn understands what they're interested in what they're looking for, which means when you use LinkedIn jobs to hire somebody, your matches are based on so much more than just the resume. Your LinkedIn jobs matches are based on skills, background, but also interest, activities, and passions. Matching lets you quickly get a group of the most relevant qualified candidates for your role. And that way you can focus on the people you want to spend time talking to and make a quality hire that you're excited about. Customers rank LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality job opportunities. So if you're looking for somebody who will take care of your business the way that you would, post a job today at linkedin.com slash SB and get $50 off your first job post. That's linkedin.com slash SB. Terms and conditions apply. You know, that's always scary, OG, how, how bad financial literacy is in our country. Or really, frankly, I think around the world. Probably anywhere. Yeah. I mean, if you're not getting it or if your family isn't getting it somewhere else, then you have to take the ownership of it. I'm really happy to see my kids in math recently going through budgeting, going through an exercise of, you know, here's all the things that you could possibly do. And here's how much money you make every every week. And their teacher said, oh, you know, you make a thousand dollars a week and you have to spend it on food and shelter and stuff like that. Oh, by the way taxes are going to be there. So you don't really make a thousand, you make 800, you know, so they kind of work with some round numbers, of course, but, uh, but it was fun talking to my nine-year-old about like taxes suck. It like takes all this money. And then you have to like really sit down with your money every week and figure out how you're going to pay for food. He said one week I didn't have any food. I said, yeah, that's awesome. Imagine if mom and I did it that way, you know, (laughs) if we just went "Eh, this week, no food, you know, I like that simulated panic. Yeah, exactly. Make them really scared of the thing you want them to learn. Just <laughs> so afraid of it that they just bury their head in the sand. That's no, so but, good. But if they weren't doing it at school, you it's you sure. got to do you got to figure out how to do little lessons as your kids grow and help them figure it out. I was at uh, Green Path Financial last week at a conference, and one of the takeaways from one of the sessions I was in, really interesting, was let your kids watch you spend money, like watch how you decide to spend your money. It does two things. Number one, you clean up your money. And number two, you clean up your money habits because somebody's watching you. And on the other end, your kids get to see that this, these plastic transactions, they never get to see because they don't see wallet money come out of your wallet, become much more real. I think that's a good takeaway as is just financial literacy in general. Thanks to Paul. And I think our other takeaway is a little I P O back the truck up. Time to go get some. Big money, no whammy. To put it bluntly, Doug Lynam has had an unusual relationship with the almighty dollar. He grew up in a wealthy family. He had some uh, long-haired hippie days running away from what he thought was rampant materialism. He uh, then spent time in the Marine Corps looking for some selfless service. And then for 20 years... He was very selfless to be in the Marine Corps, that's right. (laughs) For 20 years, he uh, was under a vow of poverty 
that led to his current profession as a financial advisor. The man who went from monk to money manager. Let's say hi to Doug Lynham. And coming down to the basement, it's our new friend, Doug Lynham. How are you, man? I'm doing great, Joe. Uh, Catler smells a little odd, but uh, I'm loving being here. Well, you know, that's Doug's job, and he never does his job. I mean, you you were in the monastery. You talk about this in your book, man, that people blame stuff on somebody else all the time. <laughs> yeah, and so you've got to take responsibility, right? <laughs> right. If it smells bad, you got to fix it. Who else exactly. is going to do it? So I'm saying, not my responsibility. Go talk to Doug. <laughs> Go talk to our Doug. Have Doug talk to Doug. Right. I want to I want to dig into your background because obviously, like every person who's interviewed you, very interested in where you came from. Because as you already know, it's not the same journey a lot of people went on. Right. You were born into a wealthy family. A lot of people have that in common with you. But you use a line earlier in your book where you say something like, "Your family weaponized money." You, yeah. Like, you, w- what does that mean to weaponize money and weaponize finances? Well, I think there's two factors to that. The first was, you know, like many people, my family divorced when I was young. And so there was this fight over who's going to pay for stuff. My mom would always say, go ask your dad. My dad would say, well, I'm paying child support and alimony. So go ask your mom. And they're basically using their children as bullets in a financial battle of the sexes. And that got really, really tense over time. So that was one aspect of it that was really disturbing for me. And so it became easier just not to ask for stuff and to go get a job and make my own money and circumvent that whole game. And then I think the other side of it, which is whether you're wealthy or not, it's not uncommon, I think, for some parents to conditionalize their their money, right? So I will give you this on the condition that you love me, you give me your unconditional love, and I'll give you stuff. And it's like, well, wait a minute, you're still doing some things that are perhaps not in your family's best interests that are creating a great deal of damage for your kids and for the family. And somehow gifts and money are going to just whitewash all of that and just make everything go away and everything's forgiven. It's like, well, wait a minute, you know, there are limits and money isn't going to solve those problems that if you're trying to use money as a tool to manipulate behavior and get a response from your children, rather than having it be a genuine relationship, things are going to fall apart pretty quick. And that was, I think what I saw. So you're saying the unconditional love might've been slightly conditional. Highly conditional. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Like, uh, well, they want an unconditional love from me, and they would give that. They would expect that in exchange for yes. stuff. Yeah, right? right, right. So you decided, really, it sounded like to kind of drop out. Like, when did you? When did you decide? You know what? I'm going to go counterculture and and uh, grow my hair long and do things differently. Well, that was really sort of the teenage years. I so sort of was looking for fun ways to piss my parents off and living in a kind of a wealthy neighborhood and, you know, painting rainbow murals on my car and a big peace sign on the hood and growing my hair out. It annoyed them appropriately. And so that was sort of my teenage rebellion. But I also found that it's sort of in the wannabe hippie community. I was reacting to my parents. It wasn't a genuine expression of who I was. I I was still being sort of influenced by their behavior, even if it's in a negative light. Right. Um, And so it wasn't really authentic for me. And I also found, I think within that community, a lot of great talk about love and justice and one world rhetoric. And that was great, but I didn't see them doing a lot to really make the world a better place. They just seemed to want different stuff than my parents, but they still wanted their stuff. Right. And so it was still, they wanted freedom, but no responsibility. And that kind of got under my nerves after a while. And so that's what I served. I am, I am 51 years old. I still want that. Yes, well, we all do, right? <laughs> right. Who, who wouldn't want to have all the freedom and no responsibility? That's sort of a childhood fantasy, yeah. right? They, they come together, right? If you're right. going to have the freedom, you're going to have some responsibility. And that's, you know, that's just life. Well, so, that's um, th- th- that must have been disillusionment to you then, seeing these people that you thought were people that were revolting. And really, at the same time, it was it was as greedy as, you know, other people that were just displaying their wealth more opulently, I guess. Exactly right. So that's when I sort of made a more even harder shift over to the Marine Corps. And that was sort of another act of rebellion. It was just the road less traveled. It was the most oddball kind of out there thing I could I could think to do. And I think it was also, you know, behind it, whether it was looking to be a hippie or a Marine, it was looking for selfless service. I wanted to find 
the meaning of life. Like, why am I here? What's my purpose? And um, those deeper existential questions have always been a part of my life. And so the Marines were sort of a really physical, uh, visceral way to sort of express it. And I really enjoyed it. That was the the odd part, as I, I really did appreciate the Marines immensely and got a lot out of it. And then I transitioned to the monastery after that because I realized that killing people for a living wasn't maybe the healthiest lifestyle choice I could pick. Yeah. <laughs> but I enjoyed the training. I, it was really weird. It's sort of that dark shadow side we all have. Um, and to understand that and to touch it very deeply and see that capacity for violence in myself um, and embrace it. But now see, how do you use that same impetus for, for a better cause, perhaps? What was it about the Marines? Was it the structure? Was it the discipline? Uh, what was it that really that you were attached to? Well, I love the camaraderie. I love the esprit de corps of the Marines and that sense of family and purpose, belonging, community, all of these things that we're all striving for in our lives. Um, it kind of gave that in a ready-made package, which was really very appealing to me. And I love the physical challenge. I've always had a kind of high energy level and that just uh, to be able to, you know, be a manly man doing manly things and, you know, blowing things up was just kind of a, a fun route to play with as a kid. Um, so all those things really appealed to me. Do you remember where you were when you decided to start looking into the monastery or what the first impetus was to make that move? Oh, absolutely. So it was when I was in college, it was my senior year of college. I am my senior thesis advisor and I became very close friends and he was part of this community. And if you've ever read, there's a famous book by Dostoevsky called The Brothers Karamazov, which mm -hmm. is sort of a literary classic. And uh, I'm going to go a little geeky here for a minute, but there's a, there's a character in the book by the name of Father Zozima, who is really this sort of wise kind, really holy father figure in the novel. And I saw someone just like that. This was my thesis advisor was very much that kind of person who I felt had a lot of wisdom to share, a lot of compassion. He had also been in the Marines and had served in Vietnam. So we connected on that level. And he, he kind of gave me a little more historical depth to, you know, America's history of military involvement. And that was helpful in my decision-making process, but also it felt like a rare opportunity when someone like that invites you to join their community. It really, it was just like a gap year. I, I didn't really expect it to be a 20 year lifelong commitment until later on. It obviously became that, but it, it was the road less travel. That was an, something that if an opportunity to hang out with the fathers of Zima comes along, I think you'd be a fool not to take it. And you love so, that as well. Yeah. So it wasn't that I had, I actually entered the monastery with very little religious conviction at all. I didn't have a faith. I was sort of looking for answers, and I felt like these brothers, in their wisdom and kindness and holiness, really embodied something special in their lived example, that they had something I wanted to learn. And why not? Why, why not take up that opportunity if it comes along? Yeah, and that lifestyle then completely suited you, you said. Yeah, it was great. I was happy as a grunt in the, uh, in the, in the monastery, <laughs> right, as a young but I was also younger than the other brothers by over 30 years. And so where, where the story sort of picks up on the finance side, of course, was that it turns out after about two or three years in the community, things started to go sideways. Like you could see what calls was your, were coming in from creditors. Yeah. What was yeah. your first inkling? Did you pick up the phone once first or did you, did a letter come in and you didn't know what it was or are, 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 the, are the brothers talking at, at dinner one night or, or, or what was kind of your first uh things aren't as good as they should be. Well, the first thing, it was sort of a funny example. We were all sitting around watching TV one night, watching a, you know, some old classic comedy and the spine on our couch broke. And so the, we all tumbled backwards onto the floor. And so a bunch of monks spilling out onto the floor is like, all right, it was this old ratty couch that we had thrown a sheet over to hide the Jackson Pollock like stains. It was just a mess. It seems ancient. And then we need to go buy a new couch. Right. And so the next weekend, we piled into the car and went to a, a local retail outlet to find a couch. We spent all day shopping for it to get the right couch, the right price, get a good deal on it. And then it came time to pay for it. And it was like, well, we'll just put it on a credit card. I was like, well, well why are we putting it on a credit card? It didn't really – it was something in my gut just started to churn. It didn't feel right, and I didn't understand. Well, I thought you guys had this figured out. I thought you know, I wasn't in charge of the finances, and – 
I assumed there was some money in the bank to pay for emergency expenses, and it turns out there wasn't. So that was when I realized how low the tank had gotten in terms of financial reserves. And then things just started building up, and we started using credit cards more and more frequently. And then the call started coming in, and, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. What's going on? And that's when I realized that the community had been running in the red for many, many years. It was quite a dire situation. So it's funny you say this, and now is where I start to pick up. And maybe, maybe even earlier, there's lots of parallels to lots of people listening, a lot of people nodding their head, going, oh, yeah, I felt that way. You know, yeah. maybe liking uh, what you found in the Marines or, or growing your hair long in high school or whatever it might be. <laughs> but in this case, it kind of starts to resemble a family. Uh, as I'm oh, yeah. as I'm reading the book, because yeah. it turns out, Doug, it's nobody's fault. Right. Everyone's responsible and nobody's responsible. <laughs> right. and, and I think what it turned out, and, and this is what I explore in my book from Monk to Money Manager, is really about how everyone in the community, including myself at the time, thought that money was the root of all evil. Like we really believed that. We thought that money was something dirty. It was nasty. Only greedy, avaricious people would spend their time worrying about this stuff. And so we simply neglected it. No one took responsibility for it. No one wanted the responsibility for it. And that's why we ended up in bankruptcy. That was what happened to the monastery. And it's just like a family because the monastery was self-sufficient. We weren't taking donations from people and we were all working full time and had our jobs. And so we, we had a commitment in our charter to be self-sufficient. And yet the simple truth of the world is that money really does make the world go round. And so what I'm exploring in From Monk to Money Manager is that idea of not only is money essential, but then how do you pair that reality with the deeper religious insight of, of all world religions, of, of any faith, I think, I think people could agree that the divine is everywhere and in every one. And so these are two universal truths. How do we bring them together in a healthy way so that money is a tool to let you live your values, me live my values, whatever, whatever your values are, right? It's not up to me to dictate what your values should be. But now as a financial advisor, I can show you how money is a very important and critical tool for living those values. Well, and I like how you kind of draw this juxtaposition between the monks aren't talking about money. And then later in the book, you talk about how to have a great money conversation about, yeah. and I love some of the ideas, like do it in public. So you can't kind of storm off. Right. <laughs> I, 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 I felt that was a little Jerry Maguire ish where they were, where they were they fire for people that haven't seen Jerry Maguire. He gets fired in a public place so that he can't raise a stink and raise his voice or anything. I felt the same thing with, 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 with your with your idea here, but I thought it was great. But but it <laughs> all revolves true? around these discussions, right? Because they're hard. I mean, they're hard. You're gonna step on people's toes emotionally, and you're gonna poke holes in their egos. And there's always gonna be if if there's a money crisis in your household, right? There's gonna be guilt. There's gonna be shame. There's gonna be recriminations, and you gotta find a way to get past all that to solutions, because it's the solutions that matter. And if all you're doing, which I was guilty of this. I'm not exempting myself from the, these problems. The monastery's problems were my problems. I made them happen as much as anybody else through my neglect and my unwillingness to take responsibility for this stuff. And eventually I did step up to it, but, but it took a while and took a lot of hard knocks. And so when you're having those hard money conversations, you really need to be strategic in, in how you're approaching your partner with these difficult – I mean because you're going to hit – not just the, because the money, you know, what Monk for Money Manager tries to explore again is that those deep emotional roots that money taps into. Like for me, all this stuff with my family just comes flooding back, sure. just talking about paying the bills. And, and I've seen that over and over again in, in my clients and, of course, also in the brothers of the monastery. They had their money baggage that they brought from their childhood. And so you're dealing with these money monsters that are just – they're just brutal and they, they can be vicious and they can really derail the conversation if you don't try to manage them appropriately. Well, let's dig into that. There's got to be then, Doug, a list of do's and don'ts when it comes to those discussions. Yeah. And so there's a whole list in the book, but a couple, of course, as you point out, is have a conversation in public. I think that helps a lot. And then I think if you can start by 
sharing your gratitude. It's like, why do you love this person? What, why did you get into a relationship or be married to this individual? There must be something there that you still love and care about that you can anchor the conversation around. So it's a loving conversation rather than an angry, recriminating conversation, which just, that's just a death spiral. You'll never, it's hard to get out of that. Yeah. So those are things I find help to start. And also don't ambush your partner, right? You can't just attack them with it out of the blue. Make an appointment almost to do it. Okay, we're going to set aside this time. We're going to go to a coffee shop. We're both going to be rested. We're going to be well-fed, right? Don't be hungry. Don't be tired. Don't be stressed from work. So those things, if you can sort of mitigate some of those externalities a little bit, then I think you can get the conversation to stay on track. We talked about this on the show before. Cheryl and I do ours over wine. And, hey. and, and we're pairing it with something we think is really fun. Yeah. It, it makes it so much, <laughs> so much easier to have some of those difficult conversations. There are people right. asking their device right now. You're 30 years younger than everybody else at the monastery. Why you? Why did you step up? At what point did you did you take control of this? Because you led everybody, but people don't know this yet because they haven't read the book, but but you led everybody through this bankruptcy process, which was horrible. Yeah, that's exactly right. I I just remember the moment standing in the kitchen with the other brothers. I think a phone call had just come in from whether it was a car payment or a medical bill, someone looking for something due. And literally what happened is in a weird way, our religious faith got in the way. We had this strange notion that prayer alone could solve some of our problems. And what I realized, of course, is that God is not going to work a miracle to solve a problem that you have the power to fix. And so we all thought something magical almost would happen. We'd win the lottery. Someone would, you know, something would hit. Something's got to work to get us out of this mess. And the answer is no. For years, we were hoping that there would be an obvious solution other than doing the hard work. And that was what we were avoiding. And so we were staying in the kitchen and the phone had just rung and I was like, what's going on with this? And I just said, look, I need to see what's happening. I need some transparency here about the books. I just want to see it. That's when I realized there wasn't anything to show because they hadn't been tracking their expenses. There was no budget. There wasn't a real game plan. And so I said, well, will you let me take that on? And at that point, the answer was, oh, please, right? They were yeah. like, yeah, you, yeah. You, could, you could have it. And then I went to the, a local bookstore and bought every book on finance I could find and started reading through them. And I realized I knew nothing. I knew absolutely nothing. The depth of my ignorance was so profound, I could not comprehend it. So that's where it all started. Well, and yeah, it, I mean, it sounds like they just abdicated. <laughs> like, yes, yeah, right, take it. right. Well, well, on that note, you have a, a piece in the book about building your financial lexicon, and I thought we'd end there because you recommend something here that was crucial for me when I became a financial planner and a guy that knew nothing about money as well, Doug. Your very first tip, look up every financial word you don't know as you encounter it. I remember having meetings with potential new clients and they'd say the name of a mutual fund or the name of something. And they'd say, well, do you know about that? And I would, I'm sorry to admit this, but I would like, oh yeah, I know about that. And I'd know nothing about it. I would make sure I (laughs) got the hell out of the meeting without, without causing any irreparable damage. And then I remember I would grab some book and and at lunch that day, I'm looking this thing up, but that's, (laughs) but that's a great, great tip. What other resources do you like and did you like when you first went to look for help? When you went to the bookstore, uh, what helped you the most? Let's see. I think the book I read that helped me the most was was Jane Bryant Quinn. I think she had a book out in the 80s or 90s that was really popular and just pouring. It was it's very dense. It's very technical. Maybe not the first best first start, but you know that really kind of anchored my thinking. And then just sort of, you know, you, you read a book. It matters where you start, but I think if you're looking at any of the the key popular books out there, they'll link you to another book. And so this was pre-internet. There, you know, we didn't have great podcasts like yours to play with. That would have been awesome to have a show like yours. I could have listened to every week. I would have loved it because you guys do such a fabulous job. Oh, stop, but, stop. No, keep going. Stop. Keep going. <laughs> but you do. It's fun. It's entertaining, right? So to, to hyperlink your, your knowledge, right? So you read one book or one podcast and see like on your show, you've got links to other podcasts. So yeah. you can just, that will connect you to another podcast or another book. Then I'll connect you to another podcast, another book. 
So just be very, very curious and follow those rabbit trails wherever you can. And eventually you'll get a pretty good overview. It'll take time, but it, it will happen. I absolutely love that advice and building the financial, because I think everybody thinks they have to swallow the elephant whole, right? And you just can't do it. Nope. And habits are more important than anything else, right? So building those habits of curiosity, of constantly learning and being a lifelong learner, right? Yeah. The world of finance is so vast, and I have not mastered all of it. You have not mastered all. No one's got it all under their fingertips. And so you never want to stop that curiosity from allowing you to explore the deeper truths and realities of life and finance. I generally don't like being negative. There is one place where you kind of go negative in the book that I wanted to point out. And I never, I had some of the same issues that you had, but there's a very popular book that you, you've not been a fan of which is rich dad, poor dad. Yeah. And if you can, if you can explain that to people, cause it really, I think tells, I think it informs Doug what you're all about. Yeah. So for those who haven't read rich dad, poor dad, right. It's, it's one of the most popular self-help books on personal finance out there. And it was one of the first books I read when I got off the, of the shelf of the bookstore and I was pouring through it. And the, the financial advice in there was just struck me as much of it being spot on, right? So you can't argue with too much of the financial advice. It was more the ethos and the ethics of the book I found very disturbing because at the time I was a Benedictine monk and I was a high school teacher and I'm reading all about the keys to entrepreneurial success. And the author has a poor dad who he, his biological father, right? Who he sort of is working in education as a teacher, who's a union leader, but doesn't have a lot of financial savvy, pretty much broke his whole life. And then the author finds a rich dad, a mentor, who teaches him the, the keys to entrepreneurial success and then has great personal success himself. That's all great. But he really throws his biological father, the poor dad, under the bus and makes him look like a chump and a fool and a, like a lazy leech for being a teacher, right? <laughs> for and, and here I am, a teacher and a monk, and feeling like I'm a loser and a fool for caring about others and trying to live a life of selfless service rather than going out there and trying to make as much money as I possibly can at all costs. And so I think the financial tips are great, but I think that idea of that just because you have money and just because you are a successful person, you're therefore a good person or you're a better person, that that makes you more gives you some more status. And in fact, as I, as I knew in my own family growing up is having money can also be a tool to magnify your ego and make you more of a selfish, greedy, narcissistic jerk, which I've seen plenty of, and I'm sure you have too. So to equate wealth with goodness on some level or virtue on some level is just appalling and is abhorrent in any religious faith. And so that's where I take issue with the book, not with the money management skills, but the idea that you're a better person because you have money. No, yeah. that's just not the case. Well, and I love yeah. how on the other on the other side, you also take the other side, which is, you know, there are people that say I should never have money because money's the root of all evil. And you address that as well. And we won't have time to get into it. But but you well, address that because there's a lot of people on that but, end. But I'll just say very quickly is that money is is the root of everything good and evil, right? So how do we make it serve the good? And that's really what Monk for Money Manager is trying to explore. It's such a different journey that we've gotten to talk about much on Stacking Benjamins. <laughs> so I absolutely love the twist and turns. The book is From Monk to Money Manager, a former monk's financial guide to becoming a little bit wealthy and why that's okay. Where can everybody get it, Doug? It's available on Amazon, uh, bookstores, retailers around the country. So uh, I'm sure if you look really quickly, you'll find it. Awesome. And and we also, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up your blog. Uh, you also yes. have a website. We, we should send people there too. Where can people find you there? You find me at DougLynam.com. That's D-O-U-G-L-Y-N-A-M. Dot com And I also have a cartoon series out on finance, which That's people awesome. might enjoy. That is so cool. <laughs> uh, we'll link to all that if you're walking the dog or on your commute uh, at stackybedjamins.com. Doug, thanks for hanging out with us for a little bit, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks. I appreciate being on the show. Hey there, Earth Day lovers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And here's a big shout out to a fan of the show named Earl. Apparently, Earl's celebrating Earth Day just like we are because he just told me I should go take a dirt nap. Well, I'll get right on that, Earl. That's a heck of an idea. Who doesn't love a nap? But first, I gotta do my duty for this show. 
probably the reason Earl likes me so much. Time to deliver today's trivia. You know, people celebrate Earth Day in lots of ways, like organizing a cleanup, planting a tree, having a picnic, or, uh, you know, heading to your closest state or national park. So here's today's trivia question. What country can claim they had the first national park on Earth, founding theirs in 1872? I'll be back with an answer in just a moment. As a leader OG, you understand that it's not just about the number of hours in the day. It's about productivity. Yes, as a leader. Thank you. Yes. And getting you're more right, done. I, do know that. I didn't say you're a leader. I'm just saying that. You as, said as a leader, OG, you know that you carries over. It's a. Oh, I'm sorry. how English works. As it's, somebody who knows leaders, you understand that wait, it's not about the number on. of hours in the day. I like the, the first way. For, it's better the first way. So more productivity means you need health and wellness, which is why. It's not fundamentally about what you eat or how to train, although those are very important pieces. What MetPro does is focuses on time management, working smarter, and establishing a game plan specific to your goals and lifestyle needs. It has a unique and important point of view on what true net worth means. Their experience helping CEOs and industry leaders like OG mean, who put like OG in there, mean unique challenges, providing them with remarkable insights for anybody wanting to see a greater ROI in life. That's totally you, man. Yeah. And I mean, and I was obviously kidding earlier, you're super busy, dude, dad, trying to juggle a bunch of different activities. It's yeah. gotta be about health and wellness. It's about systems and making sure that you have the time to put the most important things first, because when you get stressed out or when you get busy, like what's the first thing that goes, the first thing that goes is the stuff that actually keeps you sane, like exercise and eating well and that sort of thing. So we're on the move and you're hungry. What do you do? You go to McDonald's or, you know, some God awful place and a Taco Bell, <laughs> right. you know, would it be so, great if you had somebody at the back seat going, yeah, yeah, don't, don't do the Taco Bell thing. I see here that so, Met pros team of experts guide you through personalized nutrition and fitness mm -hmm. strategies and educates you on how your body responds to macro and micro adjustments to your fitness, your nutrition, and your daily routine. Yeah, it's really about having the system in place. And it's really about thinking about the week or the next couple of weeks in advance. You know, if you know that, hey, I'm going to be traveling or I'm going to be, uh, you know, living out of my suitcase or I'm going to be on the road, my kids have all this stuff going on. If you think about it in advance, MetPro helps with this you can plan for it and then you don't get caught. You don't get caught with, Hey, I'm at the ballpark. All they've got is hot dogs. Yeah. You know, and it's funny. I'm thinking as you're talking, you know, we've had Laura Vanderkam on the show recently and talking about what's important and organizing your schedule. In fact, in one of her books, uh, what the most successful people do before 8 AM or do before breakfast, she talks OG specifically about that, that they plan their strategy before the day even starts, before yeah. the week starts, like the best use of a Sunday night is to plan out your week. Absolutely. What is this? They talk about metabolic profiling and it says here, it's a process that allows MetPro to get a baseline to see exactly how your body's responding against a very specific set of variables. What does that mean? Well, the process is really straightforward. I mean, at first you go and do an interview and that sort of thing and you talk to a coach and then they give you some very specific tasks to do around eating and exercise and that sort of stuff and measure the progress or not progress over a real short period of time, three or five days. And every day or every couple of days you check in and they can see just with small changes or adjustments to those little variables, how, how your body reacts, even at the tenth of a pound level, what that can mean over a long period of time. So it's a really important step, I think, at the very beginning to go through and say, OK, well, we're going to get this baseline because then that guides the rest of the decision making from that point forward. For a complimentary metabolic profiling assessment like OG had in a 30 minute consultation with a MetPro expert, head to MetPro.co. It's MetPro.co, not .com. .com is something else. MetPro.co forward slash SB. And that'll get you that metabolic profiling assessment in a 30 minute consultation. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom. Super earth conscious, unbelievably crunchy, bandana loving, no armpit shaven, Birkenstock wearing, neighbor Doug. You know what I just realized? If you want to get really wild on Earth Day and you want to go see some wildlife, you gotta head on over to the 220 Merrill Street Bar and catch the Cougar Parade. 
We'll do that next, but for now, how about your trivia answer? Here was the question. What country can claim they had the first national park on Earth, creating theirs in 1872? The answer? While human activity has happened in the area for over 11,000 years... No, I'm not talking about Joe's mom's house. In 1872, it was President Ulysses S. Grant who signed into law the act creating Yellowstone National Park in the United States of America. Got it right? Go organize an Earth Day cleanup to celebrate your win. Then go find some cougars. See ya! Yellowstone. Have you been there? No. Oh, you got it. Well, I don't remember being there. Let me put it that way. Ah, too young. I might have been there. Yeah. My dad was a truck driver, so I went all over the place. I think... I'm going to Yosemite, I think, in August. It's funny. When I went to Yosemite, I thought that Yosemite and... Yellowstone, we're going to be a lot like each other. And I went to Yosemite and at first, at first I, I was like, wait a minute, this is way different. This doesn't look at all like Yellowstone. No, No, totally, totally different. Turns out they're on different sides of the continental divide. Hey, OG, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. And we asked our friends of the show on our Facebook basement group, uh, exactly what they value most. And uh, today we're happy to report that Carrie Ann says grilled cheese and grape jelly together, period. What? She says together. I'm serious. Try it. Don't, no. n- don't knock it till you try it. I wonder what your Met Pro person would say about that. Hmm. She'd say, no, thank you. <laughs> might not might not pass uh pass muster uh thanks carrie ann actually the answer is your loved ones and your time are the two things you value first but maybe your loved ones are grilled cheese and uh grape jelly no no judgment uh and you have more time with them it's why they created a modern way for you to buy quality term life insurance you head to stack com forward slash haven life now you'll get a free quote what i like is their calculator on how much life insurance you need. And they also, for people that have bought Haven Life policies, they also have Haven Life Plus, which are some cool benefits specifically for people that are Haven Life policy holders. No waiting for a decision several weeks. Super customer support. Easy company to work with. That's why we love Haven Life. We also love throwing out the lifeline to our new friend, Alan. Say hi, Alan. Hi, John OG. Uh, this is Alan. My children gave me one of their smartphones and turned me on to podcasts and I've been enjoying your show for a couple of months and I think you guys are probably the smartest there are on podcasts. I'm approaching 62 and I'm a military retiree and I'm enrolled in the survivor benefit plan and effectively it cost me $400 in pre-tax money to fund a potential annuity for my wife that would turn out to be about $2,500 a month. I've run every kind of scenario that I can, and for the life of me, I can't come up with a definitive answer whether I should stay in the program or decline to participate. Um, I'd love to hear your views on that. I know to make a rational decision, you need a lot more information, but regrettably, my 8-track in the car is jammed up, and i got to go fix it. Thanks a lot for listening. (laughs) And that is how you do it. It's fantastic. Rule number one. You want to get a great answer from OG, tell him you're the, he's the smartest person you ever met. That is absolutely beautiful. Don't even worry about me. Just go right I for the... He said, I said, you guys, he said. Go right for the juggler, though. Alan could have just said OG, and it would have been even even better, because that is, that's the way we get him to the microphone every day. I'm like, you know what, OG? You're the smartest person uh, that I know. It just get a little closer to the mic, a little closer to the mic, and go. That's how we do it every day. So great news there. And then... The eight track reference, brilliant, amazing. Let's talk about, uh, we're talking pension plans here. Sounds like he's got two options where he can take a survivor benefit where he gives up $400 a month of his pension OG, or he takes the full amount for himself as long as he lives. Uh, What do you think? Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, pensions in general and how we would calculate this decision for anybody, not just military retirees. And thank you for your service as well, Alan. So here's the way that I would think about it. And you laid it out pretty straightforward. You were giving up, I think you said three or $400 a month 
to insure a $2,500 a month benefit. Well, basically, what is that? Well, that's an insurance premium. You actually use the word insure. So you're buying $4,800 of premiums a year for a $30,000 a year insurance check. Well, arguably that 30,000 a year might actually even be pre-tax. So the take home after that 30,000 might be a little less than that, but let's just say 30,000. You're 62. Let's assume that your spouse is also age 62 right now. And we know just based on statistics that the average couple age 65 today, one of them will live to be 92. So there's a really good chance that one of you is going to live to be 92. Let's just use age 100 as an example. So if we needed to have a bucket of money that was going to kick off $30,000 a year and we had to kick it off somewhere in the neighborhood of the next, call it 38 years, the question is, is how much do we need to have to make sure it doesn't run out? And the answer is about 650000 If you use 3% rate of return, if you use a 6% rate of return, that number's closer to 500000 450. So one thing we can't control is that rate of return on the money, but effectively somewhere between 500, let's say, and a million dollars, you need to have it a lump sum today to pay out $30,000 a year forever and run out at age 100, okay? The question is, is can you buy insurance for cheaper than $5,000 a year to the tune of six or seven or $800,000 of insurance policy? I don't know the answer to that. That's going to depend on your health and a lot of other things, but you might be able to. More importantly, if you're thinking, if you're a retiree or a future retiree that has a pension, this is a decision that you can think about when you're 50. Because what do we know about insurance rates? The older you get, the more expensive they are. <laughs> you're getting closer and closer to getting hit by the mail truck. So if you know that you're going to have a pension, you can start calculating this stuff in your 40s and 50s and have a much lower cost and, and keep that $400 in your pocket. Maybe the, maybe the cost is $200 a month instead of $400. So that's the calculation. That's how you would do it. I don't know whether or not you're already, if you're already receiving the pension benefit, I can say almost every pension, I can't think of a single one that allows you to go back in time and change it. So if you're already receiving a pension and you say, actually, I want to change my mind. I don't want my spouse to get 50%. I, I want it all. Tough. <laughs> You're too, it's too late to do that. It's an irrevocable one-time decision. Yeah. yeah. On very limited circumstances, you'll hear of companies offering an opportunity to make a change, but it's very rare. And the other side of this pension calculation is what happens if your spouse predeceases you? And in some cases, you end up continuing to buy this insurance, but there's never anybody to receive the benefit. So that would go into the factor, uh, that would factor into the calculation as well. So so I think, Alan, if you're already receiving your pension, you might not be able to change it. It just might be what it is. But if you're not yet, that's how I would think about it. I would say, well, how much money do I have to have? The answer is somewhere between five hundred and eight hundred thousand dollars and $800,000 plus or minus to insure $30,000 a year for the rest of my spouse's life. Let's assume that that's 38 more years. And now the question is, can you get insurance for something less than $400 a month? Yeah. And let's walk through that, by the way. Because essentially, and it's way more technical in this, that is what, I mean, discounting the fact it's military, any company would do this. Anybody offering a pension is really doing the same thing. They are buying insurance on you. It's, yeah, and it's, it's in a group policy, yeah. which is why it's a little less cost effective. Because if you're healthy in 62, you also get lumped together with the really unhealthy 62-year-old. And so they have to price that accordingly. So... Uh, so a lot of times, if you're in tolerably decent health, you have the option to uh, to kind of do it on your own. But There's if, some other rules around it and some other pitfalls. But yeah, if somebody out there strokes. if somebody out there works in pensions, please don't write to us. We know it's more technical than that. But for people for people that are looking at pension options, I think it's the best way to look at it that they are purchasing insurance on your life, charging you four hundred dollars for that, and then. If you pass away first, that gives them a way to pay pennies on the dollar to pay for your spouse however long that they live. In this case, though, I think there's a different win condition if you do it yourself, which is you get far enough along, OG, and it turns out your assets are going to last long enough 
just cancel the policy. Now you've got the additional money. So now instead of the company doing it, you're completely in control. One caveat that you got to watch out for, for some companies, which is that if you don't take that survivor benefit, any retirement benefits the company might provide, they might turn off for your spouse if you pass away. So you also like healthcare benefits or something like that. Yeah. You also have to weigh what benefits go bye-bye if Mm -hmm. you don't do it through the company and obviously look at the cost benefit of those benefits as well. So, but, but a a great, uh, great strategy, great question. Not one, you know, we talked about the other day that we've, we've talked about just about everything over the last eight years on the show. I mean, I can't think of a topic we even talked about. I don't know that we've done that one. I'm sure we have. I just don't remember. I don't remember ever. ever they all run together. Ever doing point. that one. We're, we're so busy giggling, we forget. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Thanks for the question, Alan. And way to bring it, by the way. Nice job. We also get letters down here in the basement. And uh, Dylan writes to us today. Dylan says, hi, Joe and OG. While I'd never take your advice for my personal finance questions, I do think you might be able to help me out with this one. I'm a 26-year-old CPA, started my career in Big Four public accounting in the audit practice. After a short period there, I realized that Big Four in corporate accounting was... Audit sucks. (laughs) Not going to work for me. (laughs) I love how you interpret even before he gets there. I I know where this was headed. Get where the pus going. Yes. I currently work for a small accounting firm that mostly does books, financial statements, and some consulting with small businesses. Now realizing I don't have a passion for financial accounting at all. Whether it's large corporations or small businesses, what I do have a passion for is personal finance and helping other people learn to be in control of their money. As I come from a background where personal finance wasn't taught and have seen the real life results of horrible financial planning. That said, I feel like transitioning to the financial planning field may be a good move for me. So my question is this, as a CPA with no experience in financial planning, including tax planning, what would be the best approach to transitioning to this field? I have options for moving into tax practice, but that seems like only a sliver of financial planning. And as far as certifications go, no, there's a special certification available to CPAs called Personal Financial Specialist, PFS. Since I'm already a CPA, would that be the best certification to work toward or would the CFP still be better? Do people expect CPAs with a PFS certification to have a background in tax? Thanks for any help or guidance you could provide. Dylan. All right. Career question. What do you think? I just like the juxtaposition between somebody saying how smart we are and then somebody saying, I will never take your advice. <laughs> well, how my motivation for providing even a <laughs> modicum of rational, coherent advice goes way down. Transitioning into a financial planning business, really, there's kind of three options here. The first thing is hang out a shingle. Call yourself Dylan's financial planning and see what happens. Practice as you go. Not probably the method I would pick, but there's really, unfortunately, a very low barrier to do that. I was actually thinking he might even have a leg up because if he can carve out that niche with the company he's already at, he might already have the toughest part solved, OG, which is a stream of potential clients. Well, that's an interesting approach because... In my experience, working with CPAs with clients is so difficult because we look at the same problem, but from two opposite sides. Now, I get that Dylan's not working really primarily on the tax side of things, so he's not focused on that angle. But in my experience, it's always been so difficult because so many CPAs are focused on what happens right now, what happens in this tax year contrasted against what happens over the next 30 years, which is how planning sometimes looks at it. And there becomes a little bit of a, eh, you know, grinding, so to speak, between the two professionals for the clients. But that's a great idea. If you have an opportunity to add the division of what you're trying to do within your existing organization, that might solve it. The other two kind of options right out the gate are to join an existing firm as like an apprentice or an associate uh, while you work on whatever certification you want, PFS or CFP. I don't think it's materially different in terms of its importance one way or the other, or go straight to a brokerage company like your Merrill's Morgan's Edward Jones's, whatever. The biggest part about being a financial planner in the first decade is about trying to figure out how to get clients. People want to get into this business because they go, it's great. You can help people with their money and people just show up and give you all this cash and, 
I still have way more no's than yeses. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's about fit and it's about personality and all that sort of stuff too. But you have to have a method for people to find you. And whether that's a niche that you work in, we know advisors who specialize in anesthesiologists or specialize in optometrists or specialize in educators or specialize in federal law enforcement employees. You kind of have to figure that out as you're going into it because just saying, hanging out in a shingle, you know, on Main Street going, Dylan's financial planning business yeah. is not going to provide a stream of a stream of new clients. Contrary to the movie, just because you build it doesn't mean they'll come. It does. No, it's not. And so not. the frustrating part with people who get quote into the business, so to speak, is they go, cool. So when do I get to see clients? I remember when I first started out, I had a mentor share with me a story from when he started. And he said that he would work his butt off to get as many clients in the office as possible. And he said, by the way, this is the brutal reality of beginning in this business. He would work his butt off and he would sometimes get these really complex questions that he couldn't answer. And so he would take them down to a guy named Bill down the hall. And he goes, Bill was the guy that you thought he was. He had a ton of designations. He had stacks of books in his office. He would say, hey, Bill, how do we get this complex thing done? Bill would go, oh, that's interesting. You do this, 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 this. He'd say, thank you. Take it back. Take it to the client. End up with a happy, satisfied client. He said after about eight months of that, he was at the copier and Bill accidentally had left his 1040 on the copier and he saw how much Bill made and he saw how much he made. And the hustler who had the really smart guy behind him that he could ask the really tough questions to had a paycheck that was four times bigger than the really smart guy. Yep. And, and that's just a sad reality of beginning in this business is that your knowledge doesn't pay at the beginning. Surround yourself with smart people who can answer the really tough questions for your clients, but be the resource. I mean, don't get me wrong. You don't want to be a bad resource. You don't want to tell people as an example that you have an IPO that really is an internet PO. <laughs> You, you, you want to be truthful and you want to make sure you are the person they go to and you have resources around you that are reliable. So if you don't know the answer to a question, get it and get it fast. And if you can learn that, you can be a great financial advisor without knowing everything. And I think that's the biggest, the biggest lesson kind of going into an early career as a financial planner is that it's not about financial planning. It's about relationships and marketing and sales, frankly. I mean, it really is. And in 20 years from now, then you get to show off all the cool tricks, you know. Yeah. But until then, you know, you have to figure out how to get people to walk in the door. Well, and the cool and thing most is... most people fall down is kind of on that spot. The cool thing is, too, because you've had a lot of people walk on the door, if you walk through the door, if you focus on that piece first, OG, you're not just book smart, you're street smart. You've been there with people. And when yeah. somebody goes, hey, I've got this situation... If you focus on people in the door, you can look people in the eye much quicker and go, oh, yeah, I've been there. Here's what we do. I know exactly yep. what we do. Yep. Thanks for the question, Dylan. You've got a question for the show. Haven Lifeline is always the fastest way to get there. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash voicemail is how you reach that. Uh, man, what a great show today. Thanks to both uh, Alan and Dylan. And thanks to Doug Lynham. I know Doug is going to thank everybody here in a second. But great, great show. Thanks to you, OG, for hanging out with us on Earth Day. Because I know normally by now on Earth Day, you're hugging the backyard. Manicuring my perfect grass. That's right. You're hanging out in the backyard with the empty... High five in the earthworms. Empty glass of something next to you. Scott's turf builder. <laughs> Yum. I, I, Delicious. I share it I, with my share it with my grass <laughs> and if you want more of uh, more knowledge bombs like that one oh geez taking clients he and, his, he and his company for smart help in your corner head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash og all right that's gonna do it doug take it from here today what should we holy cow how's he gonna do this in three points what should we have learned today 
Absolutely, Joe. I got this. You can just lean back in that recliner of yours, pop open a nice cold malt liquor. I'll tell everybody what they should have learned today. First, take some advice from Doug Lynham and set your game plan up before you head into bankruptcy like the monks did. By focusing on frequent communication and building your financial lexicon, you can quickly become a financial ninja. Second, wondering how to become more secure with your investments? Maybe TIAA's Paul Yakubowski has it right. By investing time into more education, you'll become more savvy and then, hopefully, more secure with your financial future. But the big lesson? Don't, do not, do not try to pet the cougars. Some of them have claws. Special thanks to Doug Lynham for joining us. You'll find his book, From Monk to Money Manager, wherever books are sold. Hey, but if you want to support the show, support independent bookstores. You can use our link to purchase from Powell's at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Powell's. You can also find Doug Lynham at his blog, douglynham.com. Thanks also to Paul Yakubowski from TIAA Institute for calling us on the shortwave. You'll find the PFIN index link with all the details on our show notes page at, where else? Stackingbenjamins.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just noticed it's just as dark and damp down here as Joe's soul. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Got a quick update to the Hamilton saga to bring people up to speed. I love in the, my I love the infinite Twitter f- wisdom. Love the Twitter feed on that, by the way. The yeah. t- <laughs> my infinite wisdom. When Hamilton was coming to Dallas, I decided it's such a hot ticket. I'll buy two days because <laughs> then I can sell them for like double the price. I remember that. Make tons of money. And uh, turns out the first day came and went like a ship passing in the night. Yep. And we didn't go and we didn't sell the tickets and they're 550 bucks a piece. And so there are four empty seats at Hamilton in really great center section seats on the aisle. Don't, don't, and don't take just, me through that again. Just blows. Um, well, it turns out Mrs. OG came into the office the other day and said, Hey, just got an email from Ticketmaster. I said, what's it about? She said, turns out we sold our Hamilton tickets. She goes, remember when I, we were like trying to monkey with them online the day of the show and like it wouldn't let us do it or whatever? And I said, no, but okay. <laughs> she said, yeah, we sold them. So we didn't sell them for face value. We sold them for less than that. But so it's not as bad. It's so not you- as bad. So, so we sold them for about 1500 bucks instead of the 2500 we paid. So we're still down a grand, but it's not 2,500 bucks. Isn't it bad? I remember my mom had one of those bathroom books, you know, the books that they just sit on the toilet in the spare bathroom. She had one of those. I think your mom's books and your books are different. (laughs) She had had one that was wisdom according to kids. Mm. And my favorite piece of advice was from Melissa, age eight, which said, if you want a kitty, start off by asking for a horse. Yeah. 
which I thought was brilliant. By the way, so I'm listening to this story. I'm going, oh, that's not that bad. But if you had told the thousand dollar story first that you lost a thousand bucks on Hamilton tickets, I would have gone, yeah. oh. Well, here's the other good news. We're recording this a little before our actual tickets. So we have tickets uh, upcoming and they're still for sale. I told Mrs. OG, I'm, we're, we're keeping them for sale. There are no other tickets available that evening except ours. So in the all of the stub hub ticket master, you know, resale thing, ours are the only ones. And I've got them listed for two and a half X the price. So we'll see. I said, hey, we're going to leave them there till till we have to leave for the show. And uh, so you may not go to Hamilton. Just to I re- may not go just, just to, to break even. Yep. <laughs> and I'll I'll redo this in a year from now when <laughs> Hamilton comes to Fort Worth or something instead. And <laughs> lesson learned. But. But uh, so there's still hope that I come out ahead in the whole grand scheme of things with my diversification Hamilton ticket strategy. But the uh, this is why I don't buy individual stocks, folks. By the time by the time you go, OG, it'll be Hamilton starring Charles Barkley. <laughs> Hamilton part two. <laughs> Hamilton two. Directed DVD. <laughs> The 25-year anniversary. <laughs> See, we made it. <laughs>